in those days it was just assumed that middle class and professional families just didn't have problems. And living in a coal mining community brought such stress, such pressure to this, that I had to just, to, I had to just escape from it. I boarded from the age of um, seven and a half, basically. It was quite difficult at that time, I think, for people to accept this Asian family that had just arrived from nowhere. The prep school I went to was only about five miles from where we were living. Nobody spoke to me in that school for about two years. I told my mother uh, that I was gay. She didn't know what to do. During the Blitzkrieg in France, we were being spasmodically fired at. My brother, who's next up from me, had quite a few problems as a child and was later. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Then I had a schizophrenic episode where I uh, broke all the windows. They opened up with machine guns, the, the, these planes. I panicked in the, within the first few days of arriving at university. Both my parents were psychiatric patients. There is no way he would have come out of his childhood of sort of my dad beating him up and banging his head against the wall and things, you know, I mean, really, really viciously. The way I'd been brought up, I had high expectations that somehow I was going to be a tremendous success academically and socially. And we went to see him and, like, it was just awful. It was just like, you know, it was like a long ward and he was lying in bed and he was, like, dribbling and he was completely, like, zonked. And I was kind of put on this bed and looked around and I thought, God, you know, what have I, this is it, you know, I've been dumped. I was in and out of hospital fairly continuously until I was about seven. And my work was really slipping badly. And that when he was at home, a lot of the time he didn't know who he was. I was just getting more and more and more screwed up. I don't remember other kids coming round to play or anything like that. And I kind of thought that if I could get away from home, things would be all right. I objected to his probing because I knew that something was going wrong with me. And he said, well, you've got everything materialistically, what more do you want? But a bomb went off about, say, 15 feet or 20 feet. The driver said, where's my fucking arm? And I looked, and all I saw was, was nothing. The consultant said she's malnourished, and mum would have said, well, she won't eat properly. Um, so I ended up going to a psychiatrist labelled anorexic. He took him away and I understood that he died. There you are, there's scars there. There's where the artery went. Down to the adipose layer, there's one there. I couldn't make it, I wouldn't make it, and that basically my life was over. Again, I was just isolating myself, just staying in my room all the time. And I ended up taking quite a big overdose of paracetamol. The person who was most real to me in the household was my father. He thought that mum was a social worker. And if she went to kiss him, he'd cringe. I mean, I was just taking handfuls of tranquilizers just to knock myself out. That was the way I coped, by knocking myself out all the time. I think, in fact, his mental health problems were very, very similar to mine. I used to go down to the centre of Dundee in the afternoons and, and, and kind of uh, go to the cinema and... Uh, wander around and then go to a kind of little cafe and have high tea, as they do in Scotland, and kind of jump on the bus and go back. And that was kind of part of, part of my rehabilitation. I mean, that was a significant sign that I was, you know, I was, I was uh, getting better. Just his absolute refusal for any kind of compromise just, it just means so much to me because that's the way I am. And when I read the eulogy at his funeral, which I had written, and I was standing there talking about this, this very individualistic man, and I realised that I was standing there at a funeral wearing a blue skirt, a multicoloured, very bright check shirt, and with purple hair. How very much I was his daughter. <laughs> I have come to realise that I am addicted to these drugs. Clepromazine and Procyclidine, and for mood swings, I have Carbamazepine, which is Tegretol Retard, and I have a, a small antidepressant, which does not change my mood. When I'm depressed, I just clean the house totally, and I do it for 
the pleasure it gives my partner. I started a fight and back in the bloody patio cell I went. Now, I, <clears throat> after, uh, oh, I don't know how long, maybe a day or two, they start to explain things to me then, all right? And I am in a position to listen to them. There was this particular Chinese nurse, Cynthia, and she would sit on my bed for hours. You know, maybe it wasn't hours, but she'd sit on my bed for long periods of time and I wouldn't talk to her, but she'd still sit there. And that's kind of... That's kind of stayed with me quite a lot, you know, because um, it was just having someone be there, really. And she sort of... I don't think they had primary nurse system in those days, but it seemed like she attached, you know, got attached to, to me. And I sort of, like, eventually, after a few months, I did start talking a bit. Not about anything important, just probably, you know, about everyday things, but it was kind of quite... But I don't think I would have started, you know, I would have sort of created any sort of relationship if she hadn't sort of given me that space or just showed me that she could just bear to be with me even if I wasn't communicating. You know, that felt quite important at that time. You know, I go on two holidays a year abroad and I'm very thankful for that. But after having ECT and not knowing what it does, whether it does this thing or does that thing, I think I'm very lucky. I'm a survivor of the mental health service. What were you led to believe that ECT would do? ECT, it was like a corrective therapy. You know with alcoholics, when they see a drink and they have electric shock, which leads them to reject the booze, they will not hand out to a bottle. Well, in your mind, ECT will alter the fact that you're attracted to something. It's reversion therapy. So they told you that if you had ECT, you would stop be being attracted right. to men? Yeah. And yeah. did it ever have that effect? No, not at all.